The Lord be with you. St. Paul says in our reading today, For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. It's lovely to see you here this morning for our celebration of the Holy Communion on the 12th Sunday after Trinity. If you're visiting us today or on holidays in the area, you're most welcome. Uh, just at the beginning to remind that we're coming up to the fate. Uh, if you have books uh, or indeed for any other stall, if you have clothes or anything else, the drop-off will be coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we're very much coming to the end of the summer period. Uh, and on the week running up to the fete day on the 7th of September, uh, Monday to Thursday from 7 until 9 p.m. each day will be the drop-off of all of the goods for the fete. And also, if you're available to volunteer at any point through that week or on the day of the fete itself, then please see the uh, parish newsletter for details. And there will be an up-to-date fresh newsletter being issued this week. I say that in front of you today as Mrs. Thompson is listening uh, to commit myself to making sure that is ready to go and it'll be circulated on in the email on Friday evening. The final announcement is next Sunday in the theme of the summer coming to an end. Next Sunday at 11 o'clock is uh, we're back to our monthly family service. We'll be looking, we'll be finishing our uh, series through Ephesians, looking at Ephesians 6, the armor of God, and that will also be the service in which we're uh, commencing and celebrating the end of the summer holidays and the beginning of the new school term as that will be happening the following week. So spread the word uh, for all school-age families in particular to come along next Sunday at 11. Our opening hymn this morning is number 372, Through All the Changing Scenes of Life in Trouble and in Joy.
we pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us, and write these your laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. collect of the twelfth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, save through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We join together in singing the psalm appointed for this morning, Psalm 111.
epistle reading. The epistle is from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning at the 8th verse. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Hilary. We join together in singing the gradual hymn number 451, We Come as Guests Invited When Jesus Bids Us Dine. Hear the Gospel of our Saviour Christ according to John chapter 6, beginning at the 51st verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my true drink. 
those who eat. The words we've just heard from John's gospel, which I'll just mention briefly, ultimately is the great unfolding story of the Eucharist. Appropriately today, that reading falls at a service where we're going to celebrate Holy Communion in a few minutes. And I'd ask you, of course, to continue to ponder and reflect on the words of Jesus, that those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. They also tie in to our reading from Ephesians this morning. Throughout the summer months, for those of you who haven't been here last week or maybe previously, we've been following St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians through from beginning to end, and it'll culminate next week in a very perfect happen chance that we're looking at the armor of God for a family service, which lends itself well, I think at least, for explaining it all to all of us of all ages and stages. Two weeks ago, we asked the question why we should live a life of faith and follow Jesus. Last week, we looked at how we do that. And today, in chapter 5 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, ultimately, having answered the why and the how, he points us ahead to more incentives as to why and how and incentives to righteousness. The gospel reading is one of the incentives that goes without saying. By living a life of faith and coming to church and fellowship on a regular basis, we partake in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood in the form of Holy Communion. But this morning, Paul goes through a few different ways of how that also works out, leading to us being filled with the Holy Spirit. He moves on today in his treatment of Christian behavior from the models, the why and the how, to the motivation and he adds four powerful incentives to righteous living that we should and can follow. If we want to put it in more modern terms, all employers in business and industry know the vital importance of incentives. How can workers be persuaded to work harder and better and so increase productivity or sales? All kinds of inducement are offered in the form of higher wages, more attractive conditions, bonuses, holidays, recreational and educational facilities, and then retirement and pension prospects, one of which arrived on my desk again this week, and I was not so gently reminded with the glaring date at the top that my natural date of retirement is the 8th of February 2058. <laughs> How many of us will be here? I'm not certain I will, but 2058 seems like a lifetime away still. The best incentives, though, are neither material nor selfish. Wise employers of labor seek to give their workforce a heightened interest in their job, a great loyalty to the firm, and a feeling of pride in what they are making or selling. And all this bears witness, if it makes sense, to the nature of men and women made in God's likeness, who in addition to a job need reasons for doing it, ideals to inspire them, and a sense of creative fulfillment. Not surprisingly, therefore, the Bible gives us this doctrine of mankind, if we want to call it that, concerned not only with obligation, but also, crucially, with motivation. Paul has been arguing that because we are God's new society, we must adopt new standards. And because we have decisively put off the old life that we may or may not have been living in, and we have put on the new, as we do each week when we come together to confess our sins and ask God's forgiveness, in putting on that new life, we're told, we must wear appropriate clothing. And you may have guessed it, that's what we're going to be looking at next week. But today, Paul adds more arguments for holiness. The first concerns the solemn certainty of judgment. The second, what he calls the fruit of light, another word for the fruits of the Holy Spirit that were given in Galatians. And the third is the nature of wisdom. And the fourth is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, everything we do wants and must lead to the fullness in the Holy Spirit. But before we get to that, what of that light? Paul talks of light prevailing on the darkness. In verses 8 till 13, he talks about how light overcomes darkness. And naturally, if we go into a darkened out space and light a light, it lightens it up. Yesterday evening, I arrived back from something and Marcus was looking. It wasn't dark, 
but he had lost a Lego piece of hair on the carpet in the living room. And for those of you who know what that looks like, it's one of those incredibly elaborate floral, uh, kind of old fashioned pieces of carpet. And looking for a tiny piece of Lego on that was impossible. So I was down with my torch, looking, looking, looking. And when light gets shined on any type of space, it exposes everything else. Not least, we realized the carpet needed a hoover, and while I was doing my final preparation this morning, I heard the hoover busily going, and in the midst of it, the piece of Lego hair was found. But we are then told by Paul that when, light is ex or when darkness is exposed to light, it is illuminated, but then that the light itself becomes light. It's the motivation to tell us that when we have the light that God gives us and promises us, we're called to share it with others. So when we go into the difficult situations around our community, the horrible things that can go on, the difficulties that people have in their personal lives, we can be a beacon of light by sharing an encouraging word with them. Then we get to the clincher in today's reading where Paul talks about the nature of wisdom. He tells us that he sees Christians as wise people, not fools. And secondly, that Christian wisdom is practical wisdom. He prefaces this notion of being wise rather than fools by saying, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Again, linking back to the light. And on an interesting aside today, that quote, if you were looking, following the reading on the screens in verse 14, it's not actually a quote from Scripture. Whenever Paul or the New Testament or anywhere else quotes Scripture, there will be a little asterisk or footnote at the end, and down at the bottom of your Bible page, you'll find where it comes from in Scripture. But that quote where Paul says, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you, is actually a quote from a very early Easter or baptismal hymn. Hymns have been important, as we'll see in a few moments, throughout the history of Christianity, right back to those early days. And hymns of great theological depth are crucially important to us and very valuable. Very often, people can get more understanding from a theologically sound hymn about a reading than they can from a reading such as one by St. Paul itself. Earlier this week, the late Bishop Timothy Dudley Smith died. We've got two hymns this morning that were changed during the week by Timothy Dudley Smith. The gradual hymn that we've just sung and then the closing hymn that we're going to sing. And I have to confess, I always saw Timothy Dudley Smith born 1926 in our hymnal. We regularly sing his hymns for those of you who don't know, he was a bishop in the Church of England a long time ago, and perhaps it's the naivety of my age, I presumed he was long dead. Turns out not alone was Timothy Dudley Smith alive this time last week and died on Monday morning, but Timothy Dudley Smith was still speaking up until last year at conferences. And in one uh, speech that he gave, or one talk that I watched online this week, I learned that Dudley Smith was completely unmusical and he couldn't sing. And yet, in our church hymnal, there are 21 hymns written by him. It's a lesson that we all have something to give, particularly maybe outside of our comfort zones. Although he couldn't sing and he was unmusical, he was good at words and he recognized hymns. So invariably what he did was, as we have sung and will sing at the end, he wrote theologically sound hymns that could go to older, more well-known hymn tunes. Thereby, when we take a hymn like we've just sung, which we'd normally sing to the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord, we take a new hymn with a different theme. The one we sung was on the Eucharist. The one at the end is more directly related to our reading today. And he paraphrases ultimately scripture without diluting it. As I say, that's an aside. But the wisdom that Paul talks about can be garnered by us in different ways. And very often the hymns that we sing 
is a way in which we build our wisdom of Christ. But on the practical wisdom side of things, there are, there are two points. One is that wise people make the most of their time. Paul talks about making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. He's not talking about the days as a physical entity being evil, but ultimately that the days rush on by. This summer has rushed on by. In 10 days' time, Rathmichael School will be reopening for a new school year. I can't believe that's happening because it seems like yesterday we were closing for a school year. But the point is that people who walk in the light, follow the light, and want to be a light are, first of all, make the most of their time in a wise way. But the second point on that practical wisdom is that wise people discern the will of God. And there are two parts of God's will that we can understand Paul talking about today from verses 15 onwards, kind of 15, 16, 17, and 18. The first is the general will, which is for all of us as a church community gathered. But the second is his particular will for each one of us individually. I can give you briefly an idea of where you're going to find them. God's general will for us as a community is found in Holy Scripture. The will of God for the people of God has been revealed through the Word of God. But God's particular will for each one of us individually into things like what career we should do, what job we may do, who we should marry, everything else in life, those particular will is given to us by the presence of God's Holy Spirit within us. We can't turn to a page of Holy Scripture and get an answer to something individually particular to us. It's through prayer and meditation and sure reflecting on Scripture, God's general will for us, that we discern and understand what God's particular and individual will for each of us is. And that's why I encourage you each and every week to be a people of prayer. Come to God in times of uncertainty and decision-making and ask for the guidance of his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads me to my final point. Paul crowns off our reading this morning by telling us to live in the Spirit and be full of the Spirit. But he contrasts it. He says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, earlier in Ephesians, told us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and that we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. And now, as he comes towards the close of the letter, he bids us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no greater secret of holiness than in the infilling of him whose very nature and name are holy. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're filled with the stimulant and the power of God. A physician turned preacher of the last century, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, wrote uh, in a book entitled The Stimulus of the Spirit, where he was writing both as a physician and a Christian pastor, he compared and contrasted the two states of drunkenness and the, st and the Spirit's fullness that Paul talks about. He says of wine, relating to Paul and alcohol, that pharmacologically speaking, it's not a stimulant, it's a depressant. But he goes on to say of being filled with the Holy Spirit, that if he was to include the power of the Holy Spirit in a book on pharmacology, he would list the Holy Spirit under such a textbook as a stimulant. For the that is where the Holy Spirit belongs. He tells us that the Holy Spirit really does stimulate. He stimulates our very faculty, the mind and the intellect, the heart and the will. When we pray each day and each week for a fresh outpouring of God's Holy Spirit to work in us and with us and through us, then we will be filled with his Holy Spirit. We'll be guided as we discern our daily decisions, mundane or big as they can be, but above all, we know that we will walk closely in the light of the light and with prayer to be a light to others. Amen.
I invite you to stand as we join together in affirming our faith in God using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. To God, who loves the world that he has made, let us pray for ourselves and for all people. Lord, as you have given to your people the gift of faith, make that faith powerful as a witness to your love. We pray that as your light shines into our lives, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we will be a light within our homes, communities, and workplaces. We pray that you would let your church be constant in prayer, never doubting your power to save, and always seeking and discerning what your will is for each of us, generally and individually. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you would gather into your fold the lost sheep of this world, the unbelievers, the hard of heart. Hear those who desire to know you but cannot speak their need and heal those who are kept away from the church because of hurt that they have experienced. Lord, in your mercy. We pray today that you would guide and guard our families and all others with whom we share our lives. Bless the homes where there is sickness or any other trouble. We pray that you would bring healing to children who are ill or in pain. Comfort and strengthen parents who are anxious for their children and give peace to all and quiet minds and troubled spirits. And as the young families of this parish community prepare for the beginning of a new school, we pray that you would give them rest and peace over these final days of summer holidays and indeed, with your help, that they will be powerfully prepared for the beginning of a new school term. Lord, in your mercy. In a moment, in the silence of our hearts, we bring to the Lord all that worries us to this day. As we prepare to be fed at the table of the Lord, we ask him to accept our faith and pardon our unworthiness as we bring these prayers to him, saying together, Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We join together in singing our offertory hymn number 532. Who are we who stand and sing, we are God's people.
Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all things come from thee, and of thine own have we given you. Amen. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen high priest. Make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. Christ, our sacrifice, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For the almighty and ever-living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. Even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and mercy, you freed us from the slavery of sin, giving your only begotten son to become man and suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, Grant by the power of the life-giving spirit that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
God of compassion, in this Eucharist we know again your forgiveness and the healing power of your love. Grant that we who are made whole in Christ may bring that forgiveness and healing to this broken world. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you this day and remain with you always. We join together in singing our closing hymn this morning. So just before that, I was reminded there's envelopes with uh, items of information and advertisement and everything else for the fate uh, in the church porch this morning with names on them. Uh, if you could pick up the one relevant to you to take that away and spread the word. The closing hymn this morning is ultimately a summary of what we've been learning about in Ephesians in recent weeks by that great hymn writer, Timothy Dudley Smith, who passed earlier this week. It's number 604. We turn to Christ anew, who hear his call today. <laughs> 